Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am uh, Masataka Nakazawa of Tofok University. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to express uh, my uh, sincere thanks for giving me uh, this opportunity to present a uh, plenary talk here at uh, CLEO uh, 2016. My talk is uh, entitled, uh, Marty is Everywhere. In this talk, uh, I'd like to describe the recent challenges and the effort I aimed at uh, realizing an extremely uh, advanced optical communication infrastructure toward the beta to exabit per second with uh, new lasers. So uh, this is an outline of my talk. First, uh, I will provide a uh, technological overview of the optical communication infrastructure, where I will focus on the uh, difficulties that we are facing with regard to the uh, capacity uh, crunch. Then I will present the challenges and the uh, efforts being made toward uh, uh, breakthrough technologies for a thousand fold capacity increase, uh, specifically I will describe these uh, uh, three uh, uh, multi-technologies, uh, namely uh, multi-level modulation, multi-core 5S, and uh, multi-mode control with uh, MIMO technique in detail. Finally, I, I conclude uh, my talk. Uh, now, uh, let me present a uh, technological overview of the optical fiber transmission. Uh, when we look back at the uh, evolution of optical uh, transmission systems over the past uh, 30 years, we can see that uh, the first innovation around the mid-90s, uh, namely the development of the EDFA and its application to uh, WDM was the uh, driving force behind the increase in the transmission capacity from uh, giga to uh, terabit per second. However, as shown in this figure, the capacity increase in the experiment has uh, started to saturate at around uh, 100 terabit per second. Uh, this is uh, a, a due to the fiber fuse effect, uh, which occurs uh, when an optical power of one or a two watt is coupled into a single mode fiber. On the other hand, uh, inset figure shows the how rapidly internet traffic is growing in Japan. A uh, total uh, traffic capacity is growing at more than 40% every year. Therefore, we can uh, estimate that uh, there will be a thousand-fold uh, increase in the information capacity over the next uh, uh, 20 years. The three uh, multi technologies that I shall describe here will uh, play an important role in overcoming uh, this uh, uh, difficulty. So let me start with the uh, first uh, M technology, namely uh, multi-level modulation for a uh, digital uh, coherent uh, uh, transmission. For uh, in QAM, which is uh, an abbreviation of, of the quadrature amplitude modulation, uh, two carriers with the same frequency are amplitude modulated independently. The phase of the, uh, these two carriers are uh, shifted by uh, 90 degrees from each other and they are called in-phase I and uh, a quadrature phase Q. As shown here, by applying, for example, uh, four-level amplitude modulation to the I and the uh, Q carriers, we obtain the constellation map with uh, uh, 16 uh, points, I mean uh, 16 uh, symbols. Uh, since uh, 16 is uh, 2 to the fourth, uh, this indicates that the one symbol uh, can uh, represent four bits. On the other hand, uh, on-off king is shown on the right-hand side, where the only one bit can be seen, uh, can be uh, sent. So in general, two to the nth one uh, processes n bit, so it has n times the spectral efficiency of uh, on-off king. Uh, let me uh, briefly explain the two uh, Shannon limits. Uh, according to the, uh, to the first, Shannon's first theorem, uh, there is ultimate limit as regards the spectral efficiency uh, as shown by the solid curve on the left. Uh, this figure indicates that as the multiplicity M uh, increases, the spectral efficiency of, of MLA uh, quam approaches closer to the Shannon limit. 
uh, to realize a, a better uh, bit rate performance with a lower EV over N0, which is a one bit uh, signal to noise ratio. The forward uh, error correction or uh, the FEC technique has been uh, developed. Uh, the figure on the right shows the bit error rate after applying the forward error correction versus the input Q value, which is like uh, an OS optical uh, signal to noise ratio at the uh, transmitter. Here, that's uh, Shannon's second theorem uh, provides the ultimate limit in the minimum uh, Q value, which is needed to achieve an error free uh, operation. Uh, this is shown by the uh, red uh, dashed line. Uh, recently, a uh, third uh, generation for the error correction has been developed that enabled us to realize a bit error light uh, performance very close to the Shannon limit. Uh, this figure shows our experiment setup for a, a 2048 quam coherent transmission. As a, a coherent light source, we constructed uh, a continuous web uh, Cetrian frequency stabilized uh, fiber laser, which has a, uh, a 4 kilohertz uh, line width and the stability of 10 to the minus 11. The quam signal is generated with an IQ modulator consisting of uh, composite uh, Maha Tender modulators. A transmitted quam signal is homodyne detected with a uh, local oscillator where an uh, optical phase lock loop is uh, used to keep the uh, intermediate frequency constant. Uh, finally, the intermediate, intermediate frequency signal is AD converted and uh, demodulated into a, a binary uh, uh, sequence in a, a digital uh, signal processor. Uh, this uh, biograph shows uh, our experimental results for the uh, 2048 QAM uh, transmission. Although uh, there was a uh, large power penalty, uh, we could achieve a bit to error rate uh, below the forward error correction limit with a 20% uh, overhead. Since the 66 uh, gigabit per second data are transmitted with uh, a band with of only uh, uh, 3.6 uh, gigahertz, the spectral efficiency reached as high as uh, 15.3 uh, bit per second per hertz, uh, which is uh, the highest uh, spectral efficiency so far obtained. On the right, uh, we show a uh, 2048 constellation obtained under back-to-back -back condition without the uh, transmission fiber, and after a, a 150 kilometer transmission, you can see uh, symbols uh, disturbed after the uh, transmission due to the uh, fiber nonlinearities and uh, amplified spontaneous emission from the uh, EDF phase. Uh, now, uh, let's move on to a high speed uh, pulse transmission with a high spectral efficiency. Uh, recently, uh, we found a, a new optical pulse. Which, is, uh, which we named the Nyquist pulse to realize the high-speed transmission with a high spectral efficiency. With this biograph, uh, I will explain what an optical Nyquist pulse is. The optical Nyquist pulse we propose is a, an impulse response of the Nyquist filter and uh, similar to a sync function. It is uh, important to note that a, a sync function has a, a neatly repetitive uh, feature uh, determined by the spectral of weathers, and it oscillates over infinite time. So you may think uh, such a pulse is not good for the uh, transmission since the path of the pulse uh, enters the different time slot. However, we can interleave the Nyquist pulse by setting other Nyquist Nyquist pulses at the every zero crossing, as shown on the right-hand side. So here, uh, let's uh, look at the difference uh, between the uh, Nyquist and the ordinary uh, Gaussian uh, pulses. On the left side, uh, Nyquist and the Gaussian pulses are described uh, that realize the same uh, transmission uh, speed of uh, 640 gigasymbol per second. 
for a, a Gaussian pulse transmission, we need a, a 600 uh, femtosecond pulse, while uh, we can uh, broaden the pulse width to the 100, uh, 1.35 picosecond, namely more than double when we adopt a Nyquist pulse. The light side shows the uh, difference between uh, spectral widths of the Gaussian and the Nyquist, Nyquist uh, pulses, where you can uh, clearly see that the spectral widths is much narrower and the spectral edge decreases very uh, sharply. So this indicates that a, a highly a spectrally, a spectral efficient transmission is possible by adopting Nyquist uh, uh, pulses. Here I show a uh, Nyquist, Nyquist laser, which can directly uh, generate uh, various kinds of Nyquist pulses with uh, different uh, role of factors. Uh, this laser is based on uh, 40 gigahertz uh, regeneratively and harmonically modulated fiber laser, which has an edge-enhanced liquid crystal on silicon optical filter for controlling the spectral profile. As you can see below, the rectangular -like, a rectangular-like uh, flat-top spectral profile is obtained in a steady-state oscillation with uh, 40 gigahertz separated uh, longitudinal modes. Uh, Nike's pulse obtained in the time domain is shown in the upper side where the red is the ideal and uh, the yellow indicates the experimental results. Uh, this uh, view graph uh, uh, is a uh, 10 gigahertz, 1.55 micron hydrogen cyanide uh, or HCN frequency stabilized uh, model of the laser in which we use a hydrogen cyanide gas cell to frequency stabilize uh, the comb of modulated pulses at 1.55 micron. And again, we use the regenerative uh, mode locking with an etalon for suppressing uh, mode hopping. The pulse, uh, the output pulse with us was approximately one picosecond. We used uh, this laser in the coherent Nyquist transmission as described uh, in the next uh, uh, view graph. Here, uh, I showed our experimental uh, setup and the results for the uh, a single channel, uh, 3.84 terabit per second, uh, 64 from uh, coherent Nyquist pulse transmission. The Nyquist pulse was generated by passing the pulse through the uh, liquid crystal on silicon filter outside the model rock laser, as uh, I just explained. The uh, original speed was uh, 10 giga symbol per second, uh, which was optically interleaved to uh, 320 giga symbol per second by using a, a, an optical uh, time uh, division multiplexing technique. It is important to note that uh, there is an orthogonality, orthogonal relationship between the Nyquist pulses in the different time slot. Uh, that is, uh, when uh, data phi n and the local Nyquist pulse phi n are in the same time slot, uh, the multiplexing and the homoline detection are possible simultaneously. After a 150 kilometer transmission, between a rate below the uh, further correction threshold with a 20% overhead was obtained. In this case, the uh, spectral efficiency reached 6.4 bit per, uh, 4 bit per uh, second per hertz at the highest speed uh, so far. Now, uh, let's move on to the second M, uh, which is uh, multi-core fibers for the uh, space division multiplexing or SDM uh, transmission. Uh, recently, the numbers of core in a, a single uh, fiber increased uh, 19, uh, 31, and uh, 36. Uh, which, uh, in which uh, a non-uniform core arrangement and a change in the core reflective index were adopted to reduce the mode coupling between the cores. The cladding diameters were increased up to uh, 300 microns from the uh, conventional uh, 125 uh, micron diameter. 
Um, this biograph shows the multi-core fiber fabrication method. The uh, typical methods are the drilling method and the stack and the draw method, which had already been used for the uh, development of uh, photonic uh, crystal uh, fibers. With the uh, drilling method, each core is installed after the drilling. Uh, this method has the drawbacks of the uh, length uh, limitation imposed by the uh, drilling machine and of time consumption associated with uh, drilling a large number of cores. As for the stack and the draw method, uh, we have to prepare uh, the spacers and uh, silica capillaries additionally. On the light, uh, you can see a 12-core multi-core fiber uh, fabricated with the stack and the draw method, where the fiber length uh, was uh, as long as uh, 52 uh, kilometers. Uh, this view shows the uh, basic uh, configuration of two multi-core erbium doped uh, fiber amplifiers. The one on the left shows the uh, individual core pumping uh, using a uh, multi-core coupler uh, where the precise gain control is possible by using uh, individual core uh, pumping. But we need uh, many uh, pumping LDs. The one on the light shows uh, uniform uh, cloud pumping, which has already been uh, adopted in high-power fiber laser as a double cloud uh, pumping scheme. This scheme is advantageous because it needs just one uh, high-power laser diode. However, the precise uh, individual gain control has not yet been uh, possible. Uh, here, uh, uh, a multi-core optical isolator is shown schematically on the left side where the free space optics were used. An overview of a 16 core single isolator is shown on the light. Surprisingly, the, uh, it is not so big at about uh, five centimeters. An overview of multi-core EDU phase is also shown below which were used in the recent uh, terabit per second transmission experiments. Uh, this bugra shows uh, ultra-large capacity uh, space division multiplex uh, transmission experiment using uh, multi-core fibers. In both uh, experiments, two petabits uh, uh, per second signals were sent uh, through a 22-core uh, single mode fiber or a 19-core March mode fiber with uh, six modes. And they were combined with uh, WDM and uh, March level modulation. However, the transmission distance was uh, very short and uh, no uh, March core EDFA was installed. So these are uh, very uh, preliminary experiments as regards the transmission. But uh, it is uh, important to know that the research is now. Uh, dealing with the information capacity at the petabit per second uh, level. Now, uh, let's move on to the third M, uh, multi-mode control. In the field of uh, wireless communication, uh, a multi-input and a multi-output, or a MIMO technique, has been uh, developed uh, for high-capacity uh, transmission. In a wireless uh, telephone system, a, sing, a, a signal is transmitted through a, multi, a multiple path uh, between the multiple antennas at the uh, a transmitter and the receiver. By uh, representing the multi path as a channel matrix H, the mixed data at the receiver can be uh, separated and eventually uh, diagonalized by using the signal processing, I mean, using a, a software. So it is. Uh, Important to note that the uh, MIMO technique can also be incorporated even in a mode division multiplexing in a, a multi-mode fibers. Um, the mode division multiplexed fiber transmission uh, using a MIMO is described in this uh, biograph. The first one is a, a single input and a single output or a CISO uh, signal uh, transmission. 
for an input signal x, uh, the received signal y is rep uh, represented simply by the uh, upper equation. Uh, the distortion in mode k includes uh, loss, uh, group velocity, and uh, mode uh, coupling uh, ratio. Uh, this uh, CISO model can be uh, generalized uh, to a MIMO as shown in two. Uh, the received signal at the receiver yi is given by the lower equation, uh, which can be further uh, represented in a matrix form. By estimating the channel matrix H from the X and the Y using the signal processing and multiplying the uh, inverse matrix of H on both sides, uh, we can recover the input signal uh, X. Here, a, a several uh, a mode uh, uh, multiplexers and uh, demultiplexers for uh, multi-mode uh, fiber transmissions are shown uh, in this uh, biograph. I show here a free space optics type with a phase plate, a fiber coupler type using a long period fiber black grating, and a liquid crystal on silicon uh, filter type uh, a coupler. And Another interesting uh, mode capra is a uh, photonic lantern uh, shown below right, in which uh, several uh, single mode fibers are drawn, drawn and uh, new cladding is attached, uh, resulting in a, a few mode fiber. At the receiver side, another uh, photonic lantern is waiting and uh, output uh, from the isolated uh, single mode fibers. So, Few mode fiber output has a kind of uh, spectral pattern, which can be uh, diagnosed through the use of uh, MIMO software technique. Uh, here I show the, uh, I, I describe the few mode fibers for uh, mode division multiplexing. On the left, uh, I show a typical few mode fiber realized by expanding the core diameter from 10 microns to 25 microns, which enables us to transmit linearly polarized 0-1 mode, 1-1 A and B, and 2-1 A and B, and LP02 modes. So in total, six modes, which becomes 12 modes when we use the polarization multiplexing. In this case, uh, 12 by 12 MIMO is used for the uh, demultiplexing. In the middle, you can see a uh, coupled core fiber where we have uh, three uh, coupled cores uh, in which uh, we can excite a uh, super mode uh, by uh, changing the phase of uh, uh, each core. On the right, uh, you can see a multi-core few mode fibers. There, the, it is uh, important to use a group that has the nearly the same group velocity to carry out a precise uh, MIME operation. So here the, I show the uh, uh, group one to group five with a different uh, uh, mode velocity. A larger core size can generate more higher order modes as shown here, but suffers from uh, larger group delays. So this view shows the examples of, of mode division multiplexed uh, uh, MIMO uh, fiber transmission. At the top, uh, 23 kilometer long uh, few mode fiber with a core diameter of uh, 28 micron was used for a uh, 15 mode transmission, which corresponds to the 30 modes by adopting the uh, polarization multiplexing. So to obtain the 30 by 30 MIMO operation in a different uh, uh, speed group, a time gate uh, using a, a cost optical modulator was used. Um, at the bottom, you can see a 10 mode uh, transmission with a 20 by 20 MIMO, including uh, polarization multiplexing, where the transmission capacity uh, reached uh, as high as the 115 terabit per second and the transmission distance uh, was uh, extended to 125 kilometers. As you can see here, the system becomes uh, quite uh, complicated, but it is interesting to see that a, a few tens of uh, terabit per second signal can be uh, transmitted through a, 
uh, simple multi-mode fibers. Uh, finally, uh, I'd like to conclude uh, my talk. I presented uh, Giant Leap Technologies toward uh, future exhibit uh, optical communication infrastructure with a special focus on the three uh, multi uh, technologies. First M is uh, multi-level modulation in which an ultra-high spectral efficiency approaching the Shannon limit uh, is a hot topic. The second M is multi-core fibers, which are indispensable for overcoming the capacity and the power limitations. The third one is the third M is a multi-core, a multi-mode control in the in multi-mode fibers with the MIMO, where we expand the information capacity by increasing uh, several. Uh, higher order modes in the multi-mode fiber, uh, which we call few-mode fibers. Uh, these uh, three uh, innovative uh, technologies are expected to overcome the uh, power and the capacity uh, limitations in today's optical communication infrastructure and ultimately uh, realize a uh, thousand-fold uh, performance improvements in the coming 20 to 30 years. Uh, this uh, concludes my talk. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Bill, thank you very much for your kind introduction and for the invitation. And it's wonderful to see you in a suit. <laughs> um, thank you all for being here uh, to listen to my talk. It's a great honor. Um, as Bill already said, my group at Stanford works on quantum nanophotonics, and uh, we are interested in light matter interaction in nanostructures. Um, applications of these uh, effects in quantum optics, nonlinear optics, cavity quantum electrodynamics. But we are also interested in building devices that employ these fundamental effects, which range from optical interconnect structures, uh, quantum networks, biosensors, as Bill already mentioned, and even structures for on chip accelerators, which is something that we started working on recently, led by Bob Byer at Stanford. Let me start by describing our platform for light matter interaction. There are two main ingredients of this platform, optical nanocavities, which we use to localize light into very small volumes below cubic optical wavelength in order to increase field strength and enhance light matter interaction. And typically we use photonic crystal cavities that you can see here uh, that localize light strongly with high quality factors in this particular case, the cavity is built in gallium arsenide by etching two-dimensional periodic arrays of holes. The other important ingredient of our work is a quantum emitter. In most of the work that you'll see today, we use quantum dots, indium arsenide quantum dots in gallium arsenide, that are formed by self-assembly in molecular beam epitaxy, and they have very narrow line widths, transition line widths around 900 nanometers. As you can see here, quantum dot spectrum is narrower than the cavity resonance spectrum, or gamma is smaller than kappa. How do we couple quantum dots to cavities? We start from material that already has quantum dots or other quantum emitters grown inside, and then we carve out cavities around these quantum emitters. The goal is to have a photonic crystal cavity, for example, that has only one quantum dot that is coupled in the central region to strong cavity field. And we are in particular interested in the regime where the coupling strength between the quantum dot or quantum emitter at the cavity field, so-called parameter G, exceeds all the loss rates of the system, kappa, cavity decay rate, and gamma, quantum dot dipole decay. Considering that G scales as 1 over square root of the mode volume and kappa scales as 1 over the Q factor, the way to achieve strong coupling is by minimizing mode volume and maximizing Q factor. As I showed you on the previous slide, gamma, quantum dot dipole decay, or dipole line width, is much smaller than kappa and doesn't influence this condition in our systems. For our system, all of these rates are in gigahertz regime, which is important. As you see later, all of our experiments operate at gigahertz speed, and also all of the resulting devices operate at gigahertz speed. So why is strong coupling interesting, and what do we expect to see in the strong coupling regime? First, once strong coupling is achieved, we cannot really talk independently anymore about states of light and states of matter. We have new, entangled, hybridized states of light and matter, 
entangled states of quantum dot in the cavity field. We probe these in transmission of light through the system, or photoluminescence, and here you can see how the results in that regime look like. If you, for instance, scan quantum dot across the cavity resonance by using temperature or some other mechanism, and if the system is decoupled or weakly coupled, then the two resonances would just cross each other, as you see from the dashed lines. However, if the system is strongly coupled and new entangled states of light and matter are formed, then you would see anti-crossing, as is indicated with these experimental black lines. The splitting between these anti-cross states is given by 2G, G being the coupling strand between the quantum dot and the field, and the line width of these lines, which we also refer to as polaritons, is given by decay parameters kappa and gamma. From the experimental results, we can extract rates of the system. G is typically from 10 to 25 gigahertz in our experiments, and other rates are also in the gigahertz regime. I'd like to emphasize that there are many other groups around the world also working on cavity QED, either with quantum dot cavity systems or atomic cavity QED systems or other types of solid state emitters, as I'll mention later, or even circuit QED systems where they fabricate Josephson junctions as their artificial atoms or quantum emitters. So once we achieve strong coupling, we can do many exciting experiments, which range from probing of the strength and dynamics of light matter interaction, as we've recently done by directly measuring lifetimes of these entangled states of light and matter, which are in the hundred of picosecond regime for our system, or by driving strongly these entangled states and dressing them, as you also see on this picture. We have also been able to generate quantum states of light by using this strongly coupled platform. And we are also able to build proof of concept, new generation of optoelectronic devices that operate at autojoule energies and gigahertz speed, including end gates that operate between pulses of light that are at the single photon level, or modulators, electro-optic modulators that use single quantum dot as an active medium. In the interest of time, I will only focus on our experiments on generation of quantum light using the effects of photon blockade and photon tunneling that occur in the strongly coupled regime. In order to explain what happens here, we have to revisit strong coupling and the ladder of energy eigenstates that occurs when the system is strongly coupled. As I already mentioned, when quantum dot is strongly coupled to the field, you cannot really talk anymore about states of quantum dot or states of light. You have entangled states of quantum dot and the light. This is what we have probed in transmission, photoluminescence, many times, as I've already shown you. But the story doesn't end here. There are other energy eigenstates in the system, and they occur at higher frequencies and have different splittings. For instance, here we draw the second rung of the ladder of energy eigenstates, which also exhibits anti-crossing, which also has states that are entangled states of light and matter, and the splitting is different. It's equal to 2G root 2. In the nth rung of the ladder, splitting would be equal to 2G root n. So looking at this ladder of new energy eigenstates, you can notice that it is unharmonic, as opposed to a harmonic oscillator, where the separation between all subsequent levels is equal to h bar omega, energy of a photon. Here, the separation between subsequent levels varies. So if you take a laser and drive one of the states in the first rung, resonantly, laser can couple only one photon to that state because these states are formed by hybridizing one photon with quantum dot states. Therefore, this laser cannot reach any other states in the ladder because of its unharmonicity. And from the laser, we should be able to just couple one photon to the system and transmit it to the other side. In other words, once we couple the first photon to the system, it would block all the other photons from entering to the system. So in transmission, we would be filtering photons one by one. And statistics of photons would significantly change relative to Poissonian statistics that we have in the input laser. Let me just grab a different microphone. Okay. This looks more professional. <laughs> Okay, if we drive, if we use the laser to drive the second rung in the ladder resonantly, we have two photon transition, then we can observe the regime of photon tunneling. Since the states in the second rung are formed by hybridizing, by entangling two photons with quantum dot, then we can couple only two photons in this case, 
And once those two photons are coupled to the system, they would block all the other photons from entering. Therefore, in transmission, you expect to see photon pairs. And this is the regime of photon tunneling. Both of these regimes we first probed in 2008. Uh, photon blockade was first probed in 2005 at Caltech by Jeff Kimball, and around the same time as our experiments, the effects were also probed in circuit QED systems, and there were follow-up experiments in solid state. So how do we probe these effects? Well, clearly, in blockade and tunneling, we're changing statistics of light transmitted through the system. So to prove that we indeed observe these effects, we have to measure statistics of transmitted light. We measure statistics by using Hanbury, Brown, and Twist-type setup, or some variation of this setup. Uh, this is a beam splitter followed by two single photon counters, as you see here, and this can be used to measure second order correlations. If you have a stream of single photons at the output, single photons cannot be divided on a beam splitter. Therefore, you don't really expect to ob observe coincident clicks of the two detectors that are at the outputs of the beam splitter. And indeed, when we measure statistics of transmitted light for the regime of blockade, we see suppression of coincident clicks of the two single photon counters um, relative to the situation where we just have a laser beam, in which case all of these peaks in the statistics would have the same height. Uh, the separation between the peaks is 13 nanoseconds corresponding to repetition period of the laser. In the regime of photon tunneling, where you are filtering photon pairs at the output, you expect to see super Poissonian statistics or increase in the coincident clicks of the two counters. Indeed, this is what we observe. The peak at delay zero between the two counters increases and G2 of zero, second order correlation function, rises. If we scan this central peak as a function of the laser detuning from the system, we see that it goes under one in the regime of blockade, above one in the regime of tunneling, while for a laser without transmission through a strongly coupled system, it would always be flat at one as a signature of Poissonian statistics. You may notice that we're not really changing statistics by much in the regime of blockade because G20 goes only to about 0.85 or 0.9. The reason why this is the case is because the ladder, although unharmonic, is also broadened by losses in the system. Therefore, uh, driving the first rung in the ladder with the laser would ideally miss the second and higher order rungs, but because of this finite broadening, we still have a finite probability of coupling the laser to second and higher order rungs. Therefore, we will have a finite probability of transmitting higher photon number states. However, if we look the ladder carefully, we can notice that it becomes more unharmonic for larger detuning between quantum dot and the cavity field. Therefore, if we drive the first rung at larger detuning, we can miss the second and higher rungs by more. And we expect to have better single photon statistics at the output. Indeed, if we measure second order correlation for the detuned blockade, we see G2 of zero dropping to 0.29. If we apply spectral filtering in the same regime, we can reduce it to 0.1 or 0.15. And this is spectral filtering combined with the technique of self homodyne suppression that we recently came up with in order to get rid of the classical signal. And finally, for many applications in quantum information, in particular, it's important to also have photons that are indistinguishable meaning that they exhibit interference when you collide them on the beam splitter. And in that case, colliding them from two opposite input ports of the beam splitter would lead to them proceeding to the same output port and these two counters not clicking at the same time. If we perform this so-called Hongu Mandel experiment, we indeed see suppression of coincident clicks and can extract photon indistinguishability of 96%. So where is this going from here? There are two main directions of our interest. Uh, regarding these experiments. First is multi-emitter cavity quantum electrodynamics, where we would like to couple multiple quantum emitters to the same cavity. In that case, coupling strength scales the square root of the number of emitters. We can achieve higher coupling strengths, higher speed, and also different ladder of dress states, and therefore maybe even better quantum light generation. The other direction of our interest is coupling multiple resonators, all being in blockade regime with emitters embedding inside and communicating via photons. There are several exciting proposals listed here that use this platform for quantum antibody physics simulations. But looking at both of these pictures, it is clear that in order to go in these directions, we need quantum emitters that are resonant with each other and resonant with cavities. So how do we do that? Let's revisit our quantum dots. 
quantum dots have narrow Leibniz, but if you remember AFM image of a quantum dot array, they have random positions, random shapes and sizes, which leads to large inhomogeneous broadening. Therefore, it would be very, very challenging to go in the directions that I described unless we can control both sides and positions of quantum dots. And we started working on side control quantum dots in order to achieve that goal. One work that we have explored is indium kalium phosphide quantum dots in nanowires in collaboration with Zwiller and Reimer. We're also collaborating with Hoffling in Würzburg on site control indium arsenide, gallium arsenide quantum dots grown on regular matrix, as you can see from this photoluminescence scan. And very recently, we have performed optical pumping and also coherent control of a single electron spin in such a quantum dot, indicating that they are on par with randomly positioned self-assembled quantum dots. We're also looking at a variety of other emitters, including color centers in diamond and silicon carbide. This is our collaboration with the group of Ziak Shen, Nick Melosh, and Steve Chu at Stanford. Uh, Shen and Melosh groups can grow diamond using CVD process, starting with uh, molecular diamond seeds to functionalize interfaces, and in the process they can dope diamond with silicon vacancies or other color centers. That way we can grow diamond on a variety of substrates, including high purity diamond, and then carve out structures, including these pillar arrays that have tips doped with silicon vacancy color centers. And measurements indicate that ensembles of silicon vacancies in these pillars with 200 nanometer diameter have very small inhomogeneous broadening, making them promising for our future goals. We're also collaborating with Rocktrap, Jensen, Sonoshima on 4-H silicon carbide doped with silicon vacancies. In these pillar arrays in this material, we see also very narrow inhomogeneous broadening from an ensemble of vacancies, and pillars also lead to threefold enhancement in collection efficiency. There are many other groups working on color centers in diamond and silicon carbide, and I list a few over here. Uh, we're going back to silicon vacancies in diamond. We also observe very narrow inhomogeneous broadening at low temperatures. Uh, at low temperatures, single silicon vacancy exhibits four transitions, as indicated here. And even from an ensemble of silicon vacancies in a pillar, 200 nanometer diameter, we observe these four transitions lining up from all color centers. Moreover, as you see from this plot, for two different pillars, we have overlapping spectra for their ensembles, indicating small inhomogeneous broadening. And finally, we're working on combination of silicon carbide and diamond, hybrid diamond silicon carbide system, where we can grow nano diamonds, shown here with very nice crystalline structure, diameter of around 100 nanometer or smaller, 60 nanometer up to 400 nanometers, that are preferentially attached and growing on the edges of micro disks fabricated in 3C silicon carbide, material grown by Gabriel Ferro, our collaborator. And here we see coupling of silicon vacancies in nano diamond to whispering gallery modes of these resonators. So just to summarize this part of my talk before I move to the next topic, I've spoken about many different quantum photonic and nanophotonic structures, some of them shown here, but if you look at this pretty slide with nice microscope images of the structures that we and others work with, you can notice that they have symmetry, periodicity, regular geometric shapes. In fact, this is how we work in photonics. We just tune few parameters and start from regular shapes. And there is no reason to believe that most of the structures we work with are optimal. So we recently started asking ourselves if we could maybe design and make better nanophotonic devices. And by that we mean better device performance than what we know today, compact footprints, robust fabrication errors, uh, fabrication uh, var temperature variations, novel functionalities, and could we even eliminate brute force design or expertise in photonics from the design process. The answer to all of these questions is yes, we've recently come up with a design method for linear 3D photonic devices. We call it objective first, we follow by adjoint optimization. We can design a variety of photonic devices that look very non-intuitive, but outperform their conventional counterparts. I should also mention that there are several other groups around the world working on adjoint optimization in photonics, I list a few here, unique to our approach is objective first. So how do we do this? How do we explore the full parameter space? Let's say you would like to design a valence splitter, which splits 1.3 from 1.5 microns, and you would like to restrict the footprint to 2.8 microns squared. You may naively start by pixelating this into 100 nanometer pixels and then try filling up and emptying every pixel here. 
and that may work. But unfortunately, if you include the exclude pixel in this array, you will have two to the power of 784 possibilities, which is a 237 digit number. So likely won't work, right? If you would like to probe the full parameter space, you can do only design by specification. What do we mean by design by specification? That means that you describe input, output, you restrict the footprint, and then you apply some optimization techniques to the design region, and these optimization techniques are basically guided by physics of the problem. So it's not really a blind search through the full parameter space. And here is how one of our trips through the full parameter space looks like for a broadband wavelength splitter, where we start with a uniform dielectric constant, then perform continuous dielectric constant optimization, and finally discrete dielectric constant optimization. The structures that we end up with are fabricable. They are based on silicon or insulator as underlying design. This design structure has large transmission in two bands around 1.3 and 1.5 microns, as you see from the transmission plot. Field patterns in 1.3 and 1.5 microns are shown in bottom left. And if you scan the input wavelength, you see that after about 100 nanometers of the first band, you switch transmission to the bottom band. In addition, structures can be closely packed with about 300 nanometer separation without any degradation of their properties, as you see here from the comparison of transmission for single device and multiple devices. And also, they're robust to temperature. If you change temperature by hundreds of degrees, they still perform as wavelength splitter, as opposed to maybe state-of-the-art wavelength splitters where the performance would be ruined if you change temperature slightly. And finally, if you under-etch or over-etch structures by eight nanometers, which is typical for our fabrication process, they still perform as wavelength splitters without significant degradation of performance. So once you produce the design, you can load it into electron beam writer or make photolithography mask, transfer pattern through the block of silicon, etch structures, as you see here in the fabricated devices in silicon on insulator. Um, here again, you see devices with input and output waveguides, and the wavelength splitter is this tiny 2.8 by 2.8 micron blob on the right plot. The rest are just input and output waveguides. And you can also experimentally characterize them in transmission. Experiment is shown on bottom right. A theory is shown on, on top right. You see that the experiment matches theory very well. And I'd like to emphasize that in the experiment, you're, we're not really plotting error bars. We're just plotting transmission for three different devices on top of each other. And although our fabrication at the university is not perfect and devices differ from each other, they actually exhibit the same performance because we made them to be robust. Uh, we designed many other devices. I list a few here. Mode converters with very compact footprint, smaller than two microns. You also see here mode splitters, hubs that have different performance at 1.3 and 1.5 microns. They all look like switch trees, but have very different performance for each other. And all of these structures have very compact footprints and efficiencies that are greater than, than 80 or 90%, whatever we assigned as a target. Individual design times for these 3D dimensional devices are 10 to 100 hours but we can shrink this, and we're working on shrinking this by using better hardware and also optimizing software. Nevertheless, you get optimal structure in a few days at most. And let me finish by showing you a few of the structures we work on at the moment. Three-way power splitter, this fork is designed so that it splits the input power equally into three output ports. You also see fabricated structure at the bottom right. Um, what is interesting here is that we also constrained minimum radius of curvature and minimum gap bridge width to 40 and 90 nanometers respectively during the, the design process so that we achieve something that is easy for us to fabricate. We have also uh, designed and, and are working on three-way wavelength splitter where we split three nearby wavelengths, 1500, 1540, and 1580 nanometers. And although this looks like a bad photonic crystal, this was not really designed to be a photonic crystal, we start from actually, we start by designing uh, arbitrary shapes on a regular grid. Uh, so we constrain the grid, but then we design these potatoes, special shape for these potatoes with the constraints that you have listed on the top right and the structure performs really nicely. Um, and finally, to merge the first and second part of my talk, we are also designing cavities for cavity quantum electrodynamics, high Q to V cavities. Um, this is one of the structures that we designed. It's fabricable. It looks like a bow tie or a butterfly, and it would have to be etched in a semiconductor. Field pattern is shown on the right. 
And here you can also see the movie of how the design process looks like, of course, accelerated. First phase uh, plotted on top is our design in the continuous dielectric constant phase, but that's not really fabricable. And second one is the design in the discrete dielectric constant phase. So to summarize, the present nanophotonics looks like this, very regular, symmetric, periodic, maybe boring, and in the future, it may actually look like this. And finally, let me thank all of the people who did the work. Uh, these are my current group members, Alex Pigot, Jan Petikiewicz, Logan Su, Neil Sapra, Yusuf Kalaita, Inverse Design Team, uh, then Konstantinos Logudakis, Thomas Sarmiento, Marina Radulashki, Linda Zhang, Kevin Fisher, Peter McMahon, Konstantin Dori, Kevin TQED, Quantum Optics Team, uh, also recent alumni who have also contributed to the results that I've presented, Kai Mueller, Tom Babinek, Michal Baichi, Armand Ranquist, Jesse Lu, Sonia Buckley, Arka Majumdar, and finally our funding from the Air Force, NSF, Moore Foundation, Aero, and Global Foundries. And thank you very much for your attention.